If they want, they don't. They don't come to any other press conference. They don't show any interest in the sport of boxing. They don't care for the fighters. They don't understand what fighters go through. So in that respect, not really. Okay, moving on. I know you've spoken about it um, a lot of times today. KSI Logan Paul, yeah. um, not a shock to some people in the sport. Not a shock to some people in the sport that there's been a quite sizable backlash. The backlash makes me horny. I mean, um, if I didn't get backlash on one day, I'd be worried that I'd stop breathing. Now, it's no good people like me having a complaint at Eddie Hearn. Like, he just don't care, he's single-minded, the guy's an ice man. Now, he ain't got time for that, there's not enough hours in the day for him, with stuff like that. But, I don't know if he's got a heart or what, I don't know, I think there is something in there somewhere, but he's got more front than Brighton Pier, hasn't he, just like his old man. But, Eddie's problem is this, he's ruled by social media about what's hot and what's not hot and blah de blah If he sees somebody doing numbers, he isn't bothered. Now, I believe Eddie Hearn, you know what I'm saying? But uh, it, is, it is what it is, isn't it? It's Eddie Hearn, isn't it? And it's just... It's just one of them things, it's, uh, I just, I don't know where he's coming from with this, it's, it's proper tipped me over edge this and, you know, wh where is he coming from this, you know, all this does right, it has a knock on effect because, for example, I'm not going to name names but, obviously, I work with Dennis Hobson. Who is there around Eddie Hearn that's going to rein him in and say, Eddie, don't do that, Eddie. That's wrong. Now, for example, uh, Liam Cameron, he had a, a warning for cocaine after the Sam Sheedy fight. Now, Liam chose, and his team, Chris, who I respect and like a lot, he's a close friend of mine, but the reality is this, this is boxing. They chose not to tell me and Dennis. Now, the fight after, he fought Nicky Genman, and the same cocaine test came up. Adverse findings, a minute bit. Well, it's always a minute bit. It's not going to be as big as a steak on your plate, is it? It's going to be like, like a, a minute bit, whether it's 0 0.0001 0 0 0 0 0 0 MG or whatever, it's still in your system. Now... Where Liam messed up is this. He didn't come clean the first time, but because they got a warning, he turned around and said, well, we didn't feel like we needed to tell you. But then the other thing were, I thought you knew. Now, personally, I don't think that Liam took cocaine. I don't think he did. Now, I think he handled money that had got cocaine on the notes. Now, Liam's mistake that he made was not sitting down with Dennis and saying, Den, fucking hell, I've had a warning for this, but it's after the Sheedy fight. I don't know how it's got in my system. The first thing Dennis would have said to him was, well, who's give you money? And he, Liam will have said, oh, I took X amount, a uh, few thousand pounds of the tickets that one of my mates sold. And he would have said, is your mate dodgy? And Liam would have said, well, he's a bit of a geezer, like, which means the geezer's obviously handled cocaine at some stage. And the money that the tickets are going to are going to people who snort cocaine and they've got boxing because that's just how it is. It's an epidemic. It's a... Drugs are a society problem, aren't they? I, I can't be one of, one, one of them people to to start going on. I, on, uh, I can't take the, the moral high ground about drugs, and neither can Eddie Hearn, because we all know that Eddie Hearn likes a bit of a party, don't we? But that's another story, you know. But getting back to the Liam Cameron situation, the point is this, boundaries were not set 
it could have been nipped in the bud. Dennis would have scared life out of him. He would have said this, do this, do that, or you shouldn't be selling tickets. Somebody else should be doing it for you. You shouldn't be handling money now. Whether you can get a minute bit in your system from handling money, I don't know. Right? I've failed enough drug tests in my life anyway, so I'm a, I am a bit of an expert on drug tests. Uh, I've took cocaine and had a drug test and my caseworker said to me, this is a while back, you failed for cocaine, I said, well, I don't know fucking how, I didn't have any for, I had any since last Friday, I thought it would have been out of my system after three days, she says, no, well, it's still in your system a week later, but if you're constantly taking it, it will be, won't it, so I don't know, but the point I'm trying to make is this, boundaries have to be set, Eddie Hearn is not bothered, about people who fail drug tests if you do numbers you're going to get a date on sky dave allen don't do drugs right dave allen is so much against drugs it's unbelievable but he does numbers on ifl so eddie's got it in his head that dave allen does numbers on ifl them same people that are watching him on ifl they're the people that will be watching the pay-per-view if 10 percent of them people who Dave Allen's got on his IFL interviews that do 13 million, one of them's done, hasn't it? When he put them socks down his pants, 13 million people saw that, right? That's phenomenal. So Dave Allen's always going to have a place at Sky, no matter what you say. And, and for good ideas he's had, and for the email I sent Eddie Earn after the Luis Ortiz fight, fucking too right he should have some earnings at Sky. But what about the kids that are training hard and that are better than Dave and not getting the chances? What about them kids? That's my argument. But Eddie's not bothered because he's got this fixation with numbers. He does numbers. He's a bit like Dennis. I said, Dennis, oh, you're not going to believe it. I know this boxer, Dennis, and he's a free agent and I think we should sign him. First thing I'll say, well, does he do tickets? It's the first thing that kicks into their mind. That's all I don't know, Den, but you want to see him on pads. I've just seen him sparring so-and-so. Does he do tickets? Who's going to pay for it, Ross? There's a bottom line, a common denominator at the end is, who's going to pay for it? Now, Eddie Earn, right? He's got Dillian White. He's up to eyes in it with his drug test. So where's he going to go with him? I don't know, but I don't think Eddie cares, does he? Eddie Earn doesn't care. All he wants is the money. He's not bothered if they've done some really heinous crime. If they tell him they're innocent and he thinks they can get away around it, he'll put them on. Now, Dave Allen, like I've just said to you there, doesn't do numbers and his brains are a bit scrambled now, aren't they? But they're going to keep wheeling him out because Dave Allen's like a... Like a uh, he's like a Logan Paul. Do you know what I mean? He's like a Logan Paul. That's what Dave Allen's like. He's like a Logan Paul. And what's going to happen is, Dave will keep getting dates on Sky and they'll keep wheeling him out. Because he does the numbers, doesn't he? Do you know what I mean? So, it's just one of them things. It's boxing, isn't it? But you've got to understand that these people are going to get chances now. When Eddie Hearn saw that Logan Paul thing and KSI fight, he's saying they can't fight and blah de blah He trashed it, didn't he? He's trashed it, but secretly inside, he wanted to, he wanted to put it on, didn't he? Now, do you see where I'm coming from? What he does is, he says one thing and he does another, but... He's a hard worker, and you've got to admire that hard work and dedication. But he has got no scruples. The reason he has got no scruples is because of the following. He's never had any boundaries set in his life, has, has he? He was a school bully. Now, I'm not going to mention this famous person's name, but we all know the famous person who Eddie Earn was bullying at school, don't we? We all know what happened. He got kicked out of school. Now, I'm not going to mention this famous person's word because Nick will edit it out anyway and we don't want any lawsuits but uh, or legal issues. 
but there's been no boundaries set. His dad's fetched him up, but his dad's not always been there, has he? So Eddie's been at home. He's been running right at home with his mum and his sister. So he's been the man of the house. He's the dominant one. He's used. He's the mouthy kid who's, you know, always acting the goat, and he's the one that's going to rub you up the wrong way. He's just one of them kids. He's very irritative, and he can get on your nerves. Now that's why he walks around with security. You cannot get near him. You cannot get near him. But the moral of the story is one thing, and one thing only, and it's the common denominator in all this. Money is what drives him. Money. Behind the fancy suits and the fake teeth and the, the comb over. Money is what drives him. Money. Money. Now, nothing else matters to this man except a pound note. I've had it myself. I've had a dealing with him. It's pound notes that he's bothered about. Now and winning they like to win his dad's a winner and eddie's got a winner's mentality he doesn't like to lose <coughs> now shut up back and you and i'll spray you with that stuff again right what what eddie likes to do is win now if he don't win he's a bad loser now when frampton left him he were in bits of a carl frampton i know that and he knows that that really dinted his ego because he was the first person that's ever left him. Now when you leave, man, you... Oi! Stop barking, oi! Be a good boy. You just going to stop barking while that is filming. Right. Frampton were the first person to leave him. When you leave Man United, it's downhill, isn't it? Although now, it can, it can be uphill if you go to Liverpool or Man City, can't it? Oi! Stop barking, be a good boy. Come on, stop it. What's the matter with you? What got into you? Said he earned luck. But the moral of the story is money is Eddie's motto. That's all he's interested in. Listen to this now, listen to this bit here. So in that respect, it's almost become like a secret love of mine. Um, you just gotta be smart, you know? And you gotta understand that this is a new generation that we live in where YouTubers and people of significant social media value have become role models and stars and I wanted to make this as credible as possible by making them follow the code, turn professional, lose the head guards, 10 ounce gloves, someone's going to get knocked. Right, we've been over this before, haven't we? Eddie can't put this show on unless they go professional. He's not allowed to do it by the rules. Rules, it's rules in America and England. He's got to have them turn pro to put the fight on. These two fighters here will not have five fights apiece, trust me. Yeah, it's going to be a proper tear up. But on the undercard, we make sure that we have World Championship Boxing, we make sure that we have 50-50 fights, and we make sure that the new audience that we're going to bring into the sport can witness the greatness of the sport, rather than... Could you imagine putting Billy Joe Saunas in against this knockover that they've got lined up for Billy? So Billy jumps in with a knockover, right? Shows all his skills off, and let's, let, let's have it right. Billy Joe Saunas on a scale of 1 to 10 as regards skills... Well, he's a 10, isn't he? He's a 10 like Tyson Fury. There's no ifs or buts. That, those two, um, you, you throw Cal Zaggy in with, a, in, in, in with that, wouldn't you? Um, you know, Lomachenko, Mayweather. They're, they're, that, they're in that bracket, aren't they? They're a 10, right? And you're going to get Logan Paul and KSI making their debut, but they're the headline act. People are going to sit there and think, what are we paying for here? These are headline that. How, did, how crap is that? And six YouTubers on the undercard all fighting each other. Not interested in that. Bring them in. We hope to steal them. You know, we hope that the boxing world can steal and captivate this huge audience that's bigger than any boxing event out there. And I hope that they become followers of Boxing Social. I mean, you will be there that week. You will do more views than probably you've ever done. You know? And, uh, well, if you get access. And, um... I'm excited about it, it's going to be crazy. I mean, I've not sold out, I know we sold out MSG, but we're going to sell out Staples Centre this time around, and the, I mean, the, the, the build-up's going to be massive. Talk about credibility and having them turn pro, what about diluting professional boxing? We had a, did an interview with Nigel Travis, and he had a few things to say, and he said that you have to respect the honour of the sport. Do you not see that? You're somebody that's who's, what, you've been around boxing for doing. 20 years. That's what we are doing. We're respecting the honour of the sport. If you want to do it, don't do it as an amateur, with head guards on and big gloves. 
do it as a fighter. Like, no, 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 Eddie, no, you're lying there, Eddie. No, he's lying here. What, what he means is, Eddie was told he can't promote these in England unless they turn pro. Now, so then he's thought, well, I might as well do it in America then, aren't I? He's not going to share that money with Sky. And another thing as well, do you know Dazone? So this is another thing that I've heard on Grapevine. The, the stuff that people send me is unbelievable, but I tend to double check or have a good think about it first after checking with my peers. Now, the good thing about this is this. Dazone, they desperately, desperately, desperately wanted Joshua to keep winning and to keep it in America now. This first fight were in Manchester, KSI Logan Paul. It's now in America. Same as Joshua. Eddie's taken the massive events to Dazone. And I think with his Sky contract up next September, I think that the writing's on the wall. I think that Sky are going to share their 20 dates with other people now. And I think that's good. Eddie might get a couple of dates off them, I think that's good. But I don't think there's going to be this exclus exclusiv exclusivity or whatever you call it. Exclusivity no more. Exclusivity, that's it. No more do you. But, but listen to this here, listen to the lies here. He's forgetting to say that he tried to put the fight on with Edgear and all that, but they said, no, you've got to, you can't do it, Eddie. Listen. They trained hard. They're in great shape. The fight weren't that bad. Some people have a chip on their shoulder. I've seen comments from ex-fighters that might not have done overly well from the sport who say, you know, I worked my whole life, you know, to get this. Well, you didn't build a fan base. You didn't build a business like KSI and Logan Paul have. And you weren't good enough, by the way, as a fighter. That's life. Okay? So, I'm not going to... What Eddie? What uh, what were Eddie good? What, what were Eddie any good at? What's been Eddie's struggles in life? What has he ever had to struggle about? Let me tell you a little story. It's a story about Eddie telling a joke, right? Eddie told this joke. Everybody were there in this club. And to be fair, to be fair, he's not tight. Eddie had ordered the drinks. They were all there. Eddie Coldwell, Bell, you. They were all there. And Eddie's told this joke, and every single person, right, that were there, were all laughing, except two people. Them two people were Carl Froch and Glenn McCrory. Everybody else were laughing and falling about all over the floor. Now, Glenn McCrory likes a party, he likes a drink as well. Now, for him to not be laughing, well... It reminds me of that scene from Sopranos where Tony's visualising them all stood around him. It's the Peachman Feech. It's called Feech. I'm going to try and find it and slip it in here. And everybody's laughing at this joke except Feech because he knows what Tony Soprano is. Now, I'm not saying that Glenn McCrory and Carl Froch didn't know what Eddie Irwin were, but they were the ones that weren't laughing. Everybody else were laughing, I heard. Now, the joke were pretty crap at the time, but Coldwell and Tony Bellew were rolling about all over the floor. But Glenn won, because he, he's his own man, isn't he? And Frotch is worth over 20 million, so he don't need to, he don't need to be piggybacking on anybody, does he? But the point I'm trying to make is this point I'm trying to make is this when your social standing is as high as Eddie's you can do exactly what you want now Eddie's at the top now the only way now is down for example if I'm in a pub and there's a guy who comes in and he starts and he, and he comes out and he says something a bit smarmy or something and you're in a pub and the guy's basically on skid row he's a, he, he, he's his social standing is not as high as this other person's who sat there telling a joke and he turns around and he says I don't believe that, mate. He's just going to turn around and say, off off, and people are just laughing, they'll turn it on him. But it's his opinion, isn't it? If he don't believe it, if the tramp doesn't believe the flash guy at the bar, well, that's up to him, isn't it? 
but everybody else around the flash guy will believe the flash guy won't they because the tramp his social standings not as high as the flash guys in it so Eddie Earns at the bar he tells a joke everybody laughs but the ones who don't laugh are the ones who've seen it and heard it all before aren't they they don't need to be up Eddie Earns arse do they they'll just sit there and think same old Eddie do you know what I mean but I don't know what they were thinking that time Glenn and, and, and Frotch but you know I've heard the story second hand but it's a true story not everybody wants to laugh at your jokes right but when you're in a position of power, you have to laugh. You have to do the back slapping. For example, Chris Smedley don't go to after parties at boxing shows. Never has, never will, don't drink. People go to these shows because they want to get themselves out there, don't they? This is where the deals are done. This is where friendships are built. Now, forgive me for speaking, but it shouldn't be like that, should it? But when you've got somebody who's a bully, and that's what Eddie is, he's a bully, he's a power bully. Everybody will laugh at his jokes. Everybody, because he's in control of the situation, isn't he? He is the numero uno in boxing in this country. Now, nobody dare say a word to him now. I know what people secretly think about him because I speak to these people. But well, then when I pull them about it, they'll say, well, what can we do? We've got to think, we've got to do as best for fighting, haven't we? And I'll say, yeah, you have. Yeah, you have, but don't tell me. Tell him. Tell him. It can't be me. I can't be the one that's standing up to this because it's like I'm pissing in a hurricane. All right? If we want to stop this man ruining our sport and get back to the days where they're putting proper fights on, We've got to tell this man what we think. We've got to vote with our feet. Now, that's what a movement is. It's a gathering of people that stand up for what's right. Now, I believe that Eddie Earn inside of him, is a good person. But I just think he's getting a little bit carried away with himself. And he loves his son that much. If he were a bar of chocolate, he'd eat himself. But he's abusing the situation and he's abusing his power he's not only throwing fighters under the bus and abusing them but he's now abusing fans in now he's insulting the fans now he's trying to get a new generation and I can see what he's trying to do he's trying to take boxing into 21st century but I don't think this is the right way to do it what they're doing they're trying to they're giving a platform and they're trying to con the way there now He's trying to get you all to part with your 20 quid for this fight. That's all he's doing. But if he can do it to 2 million people and create enough hype, you'll all think, do you know what? I mean, I'm going to have to watch this because if you've got a platform, you could, you could put any fight on, can't you? I mean, Joshua sold out Cardiff, didn't he, when he fought Takam. But he were really fighting Pulef. Now, with 12 days to go, he's not got an opponent. Now... You can get your refund back then. But what did he do? He slipped Takam in, didn't he? He had to do. He had that many complaints. They, had, they slipped Takam in. And do you know what? Do you know Takam got more money than Pulef? How's about that? Did you know that? And the promise of other fights on Sky. The point I'm trying to make, and I've gone on and on today about it, and yesterday, is this. It's become unten untenable now. It's bad. It's really, really bad. And do you know what? I've had enough. I have really had enough. I don't know what I'm going to do, but probably crush a grape or go for a spin in my car and get it out of my system or drink another bottle of Blue Moon so I can't drink and drive. So I'm on my second bottle of Blue Moon. But the moral of the story is this. Be your own man. There's a lot of people in boxing... They want to tell me things, but they don't want to be, do it themselves. Don't tell me, tell them. Or put it on your Twitter. Or say to me, look, I'd put it out there, but I want to work with him. At least give me that. At least admit you want to work with him down the line, because at least you're being honest with me then. Do you know what I mean? But as far as I'm concerned, 
KSA Logan Paul ain't going to bring any new people into boxing. All it's going to do is line Eddie Hearn's pockets. And in a year, when I say to on my channel, when I say, well, you didn't bring any new people into boxing, Eddie, or we're looking at his interviews, he's going to say, yeah, but we had a go, didn't we? And But secretly, secretly, behind closed doors, Eddie will be saying things like, you know that muggy talk that he comes out with? Oh, I, go on my son, or that, uh He's had it off, we've had it off. Talking like a gangster, like he's sat in sugar up with his mates, but really, he ain't a gangster, is he? He's just a little kid, he's a little boy, isn't he? He's a 40 year old spoiled brat that his dad were never there for him and he were, and he were able to run right around his sister and his mother all day at home, terrorising them while up in his bedroom smoking weed. That's basically it in a nutshell, because he's admitted he was a weed smoker, hasn't he? So, do you know what I mean? But the moral of the story is, the sport that I love at the moment is, it, it's become trashy, it's become manipulative, and it's become about money. We've got the Dillian White B sample. What's happening with that fucker? We've got that. Then we've got Eddie Hearn putting Joshua, our world champion, out on in Saudi, who's got a chance to fight for all belts, and who controls the show? We've got Joshua saying he wants it in Saudi. Joshua wants it in Saudi. Because his team say that. So his team haven't got much faith in him, have they? If his team think Joshua's going to beat Ruiz again, they'd have had it on in England, wouldn't they? Where they feel safe with their ref, but no. Oh, no. No, Joshua wants to... Uh, Going to Saudi for money, and Eddie Hearn's going to be out there for his 20%, isn't he? Eddie Hearn is on, what is Joshua getting? 41 million. 41 million, so Eddie's 20% off that, plus they get all commercial, don't they, match room. Eddie Hearn will get about 12 million quid from this fight. He'll be on more than Andy Ruiz, and he's not in the ring taking the punches, is he? Hey, Eddie will be getting his 20% of 41 million, which is 8.2 8 million, 8 .2 million. So Eddie will get his 8.2. They'll get kick. They'll get a kickback off at of, off of Sky, and the bit commercial. Don't. I, I think Barry Earn, Don't quote me on this, but I think that the international TV rights and all that. I think they they they'll get a cut off all that as well. There's all sorts of incentives, but they'll walk away with over 10 million. They'll clear, they will clear 10 million off this fight net. They're going to get a million pound a week leading up to this fight. I am telling you now, sure as eggs are eggs, they will get paid on this fight. But it is what it is, isn't it? Nor if I've got a chance for, I don't know, 100 million people worldwide to watch this fight and 20,000 people in the Staples Centre and I've got the opportunity to convert 2% of that audience to the sport then I'm all in. So he's turning it from money into numbers now and hoping to bring fans in. He don't care for fans. If he were doing this to bring fans in he'd be doing it for free just to have a go wouldn't he? Just to try and put bums on seats but he in. No I'm not going to sit there for that sport and tell you that fight is a great spot. is the greatest fight of all time it's not it's great fun it'll be competitive and it will be crazy but let's try and keep this audience grow the sport we can't just be naive enough to sit still and say well the audience is what it is so that's how it is mate you know by having for hardcore boxing fans or for people I mean Devin, Devin Haney and, let me finish please you just said it in one word hardcore boxing fans I'm a hardcore Eddie Earn, an hardcore boxing fan. Jesus. <laughs> or boxing fans. I love hardcore boxing fans. If only hardcore boxing fans exist, this sport will die. Understand that. So, your next question about the undercard is, we are trying to show this massive audience greatness. Might be Billy Joe Saunders, might be Devin Haney, might be other young guys. And in the process, build those fan bases and put eyeballs on those fighters that we cannot get anywhere else in the world. What a load of old toss. What, what, what is he coming out with now? This is just utter rubbish that we're being fed here. It's rubbish and do you know what? I think I've had enough of it. I just want to get this McCracken one out of the way and I might just, I might just go out and relapse. 
I am thinking about relapsing tonight. I am thinking about ringing up my mate and getting a gram of pure beak. You know the stuff that you need an hammer to break. Because you can always tell when it's good that you can't squash it with your fingers. And it's really sharp. You need an hammer to break. I'm thinking about getting some pure beak and doing the job properly. So I understand the criticism there as well, but... No, I'm not really. I'm stopping in. Just have a brain and be smart enough. I didn't want to do the first one. You know, I looked at it, I was like, no, not for me. I saw it with my own eyes, I saw the noise, I saw the numbers, I saw the action, and I thought, I'm doing it. Like it or not, love me or hate me, tough luck, it's on. See, that's the single-mindedness of it. He's doing it and he's saying, do you know what, fuck yous, I'm doing it. You've got to admire that in a way, because money rules him now. He's obviously never at home much, is he? So... You know what I mean? He's got everything he needs in the world, but how I look at it is this. He's going to turn people away from the sport. Hey, if he, if he gets it right and I'm wrong and he's the saviour of the sport, well, I'll tell you what, he deserves a knighthood. But this is how I look at it. If I'm a boxer and I'm turning pro and I've had four or five fights and then I see another boxer and he's having his debut, and he's on Sky pay-per-view, and I'm an Eddie Earn fighter, or I'm a, I'm a fighter with somebody else, I'm going to be fuming. I'm going to be fuming. The question I was going to ask was, what about fans who want to watch Billy Joe Saunders and Devin Haney, but don't want to pay to watch KSI versus Logan Paul? Well, but you're a sub subscriber of the zone. Now, if you're watching those guys, you In the UK, anyway. In the UK, you don't even know how you're going to watch it. What's, what makes you think it's 100% pay-per-view? It might not be. So, we'll have to see. But in that respect, You've got to make your decision, as always. Okay, Eddie Hearn, thanks very much for speaking to Boxing Social. Cheers, got to go. Right, well that's Eddie, that's Eddie Hearn's version of events now, right? Eddie Hearn is doing what he wants. Now, sure as eggs are eggs, as I've said before, he's going to do what he wants. Nobody is going to stop him. Nobody can stop him anyway. He's, he's gone too far now. He's gone too far now. Nobody can stop him. He's just going to do what he wants, and that's basically it, really. And I'm just going to do what I want with my channel now. Eddie ain't bothered about this. No matter what, he don't even like me. He sent me an email, you're not my favourite person. Well, so what? You're not my favourite person. I used to have a lot of time for Eddie, but I think that greed has took over. Greed has took over him, and it's made him... It's made him the, per the person that he is. And I think it's a shame... I think it's a shame that it's ended like this because where where is boxing going at the moment? Where is boxing going with, at the moment with this? Well, what is this? What's this? What is this now? What 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 is it? What is it? What is he doing now with fans? What is he doing to the fans? Putting this on, eh? What is he doing? It's unbelievable. And the, the fact is, they're being allowed to get away with it. They are being allowed to get away with it. And they're all in on it together, you know. Adam Smith, a lot of them. All in on it together. All we need now is Johnny Nelson wheeled out there. They're all in on it together. And do you know what I think the problem is at the moment? I think that Dazone... I think that Dazone are a problem. I think they've turned his head and they've caused a load of problems. They've caused a load of problems in boxing along the lines and that's, that's what I think the problem is. I really, really do. I think that's the problem at the moment. Dazone, they've turned his head and nobody knows whether they're coming or going. That's what I think. But... It is what it is, isn't it? But let's get on to the McCracken video now. And uh, let's see if I can just get this in there. Right. Right, McCracken. Let's see where he is. Uh, let's have a look. Oh, McCracken. Where, where am I going here? Oh, hang on a minute. Yeah, Boxing Social. 
let's have Robert McCracken on now. Let's see what let's, let's, let's see what he's got to say. Videos. Here we go, Robert McCracken here. Robert McCracken. Skip ad. See, that's a good interview. With that oh, uh, McCracken admits mistakes were made. So, so let let's see what McCracken's got to say about it all. All right, here we go. Big urn. This is what he's known as in boxing. Big urn. Only Carl calls him that. Big urn. B. I G E A R N Big Earn because all he does is earn big, so he's called Big Earn. Rob, how you doing? Yeah, I'm all good, thanks. Oh, it's not Rob Terry, it's that Andy. Who is it? But we've got who's that? Is that Michelle Phelps there? Yeah, I think that's Michelle Phelps in it. Yeah, you can tell by her mouth because her, her mouth always looks a bit like Daffy Duck, doesn't it? Yeah, obviously you've had a bit of a journey these last few days. How have you found travelling across from Saudi Arabia to New York and now back in London? Yeah, it's been no problem. It's not that hard. It might not be hard for you, but I'm sure for some it would be. Ruiz Joshua 2, the, the tour ends here. How are you going to look to change things up in camp in preparations for the rematch? Yeah, he's just got to use his reach and, and be smart on the night. And, you know, he's capable of doing that. Ruiz is obviously a really good fighter. But Ruiz needs to get close to fight, so you know we got yeah, Big Josh has got to employ tactics that, that stop Ruiz doing that and be smart when he is up close. Use his jab better and, and be smarter with Ruiz when he's up close with him. Simple stuff like that. But you know, doing it in the ring is, is tough. On reflection on the first fight, how much back? How many times have you watched it back, and what have you learned from it? Yeah, you, you know, you, you can learn a lot from from any fight. Um, it, he exchanged with him, he, he knocked Ruiz down and then he charged in and got caught himself. No, 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 no! I'm fed up of hearing about this, he got caught, he got charged in and if he hadn't have got caught on top of his head, blah de blah de blah. Listen, he had two rounds after the first knockdown to get back into gear and listen to his corner. So his corner had two two times to speak to him to correct things so no 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 I don't want to hear any of that no no and, and he didn't fully recover from from the shot on the temple that's the reality of it so you know you, you got one or two experts saying he should have said this year he, he didn't recover from the shot and he didn't recover in the three rounds and that was the problem he was in a fog so um, going into the next fight hopefully you know AJ will be fully fit and, and gets a chance to redeem himself and, and give a far better account of himself but Ruiz is dangerous there's no no doubt about it and he's quick as well. You had those rumours after the fight that he was not down sparring and he was uh, struggling with a panic attack just before the fight etc what did you make of it all? You know it's just it's no there was no panic attack and there was no knockdown in sparring that's that's the reality of it but yeah it was just a really difficult night and you know you've seen it time and time again in heavyweight boxing it's a dangerous sport and they, you know they, they carry big power that's why it's fascinating that's why everyone loves heavyweight boxing and you know it's a huge lesson for Anthony to have to learn in, in the ring but you know there's, there's been you know legendary fighters who've learned the same lesson and come back and, and, and redeemed themselves and got the win so it's a sport and it's boxing it's you know it's not life and death Stepping straight back in for the rematch, would that have been your preference? I just don't think it's realistic to go off and have these two or three warm-up fights that, that some people have said because in Anthony Joshua world and the way the promotion works and stuff, you know, how is he going to have the time to, to do that? And, and you know, who's he going to fight and, you know, where is it going to be? And uh... Well, Robert, what you're forgetting is this. If Andy Ruiz gets injured, we're too weak to go. Right, two weeks to go. If Ruiz is injured, why don't you tell the fans who Eddie Hearn has got as a backup? Answer that question. Or why wasn't Rob Tebbett, Coogan Cassius, or Michelle Phelps say to Eddie, Eddie, is there anybody lined up if Ruiz gets injured? Like you had Tackham on standby all that time for Pulev. Who's the backup for Ruiz? Because the rumours coming out of America are Ruiz might be injured with two weeks to go. So 
who, who's backup plan Eddie? You know, he's already two fights a year, and that would be no different for warm up. So he didn't he didn't entertain that idea in the first place, and you know it'd be difficult for, in reality to actually make that happen. It wouldn't be simple; it would be difficult. So you know, the rematch is there, and Anthony wants the rematch. I believe if he gets it right on the night, he can win win his titles back, and, and, and that's where we go. Since the defeat. What have you seen in Anthony with regards to his mentality and the change in that? Well, it's the same when everybody loses. I think it's just a real blow, but then, you, you know, you have a question to answer. Is, is this for you or, or, you know, what do I want to get back in there and get my titles back? Well, look, Joshua might not want her to fight, but I can assure you, I can assure you this, right? If you're a man, 50-year-old ex-boxer, and you're running a place called EIS at Sheffield and you're on a couple hundred grand a year up there and then you've got Joshua twice a year writing your checks out for 1.5 million each time and then you've got a chance to get a check wrote out for 4 million just for one more fight and it could be his last are you going to take it knowing what you've just seen against Ruiz knowing that your man isn't what he's been built up to be or are you going to say no we're going to go a different route and we're going to rebuild of course you're going to take it because there's all the signs are pointing that joshua's had enough but he's not going to come out and say that is he but if he's got anything left i can assure you ruiz will probably beat it out of him we've seen it a million times in boxing where the rematch is the same or is very different different to the first fight lots of times the rematch is unrecognisable from the first fight and the person you think is going to get beaten in the rematch wins easily and vice versa. It's boxing, it's it's exciting, anything. Tell me a rematch, tell me a rematch where it's gone the opposite way, where the guy's done what he's done, what Joshua's done. Tell me a rematch, Robert. Tell me one, because I'm racking my brains and I can't think. Happen, but... You know, AJ has the height and reach, and he's just got to maximise it and use it against Ruiz. Oh God, success. they're coming out with that height and reach! Do you expect to try and replicate Andrew Ruiz's style in preparation with regards to sparring and that? Well, there's plenty of boxers that, that, that can hook and can get close and know the, know the way around. Um, it's not, you're not going to get an Andrew Ruiz, that's the reality of it. But you can get similar and you can work on things, but... I don't think, you know, I've ever preferred a fighter for a professional fight who's had... I Michael Hunter, he's very similar yeah, to him. Uh, you could get Dave Allen. Could get Dave Allen in. I mean, you've had Dave Allen sparring Joshua before. He's not an Andy Ruiz, but he's same height, same sort of uh, physique. You know, if Dave's out of shape, you could get Dave Allen in. You could pay him this time instead of him sparring for free. Thanks. Yeah, obviously you've had a bit. In Anthony, with regards to his mentality in the chain. In match, I believe if he gets it right on the night, he can win, win his titles back, and, and, and that's where we go. Since the defeat, what have you seen in Anthony with regards to his mentality and the change in that? Well, it's the same when everybody loses. I think it's just a real blow, but then he, you know. You have the question to answer is, is this for you or, or you know what do I want to get back in there and get my titles back? We've seen it a million times in boxing where the rematch is the same or is very different. It's going to get beaten, the rematch wins easily and vice versa. It's boxing, it's you know, AJ has the height and reach and he's just got to maximize it in you. Keep going on about this height and reach. I'm not buying this height and reach at all. I'm not buying it. Is it against Ruiz to be successful? Now, how do you expect to try and replicate Andrew Ruiz's style in preparation with regards to sparring and that? Well, there's plenty of boxers that, that, that can hook and can get close and know the, know the way around. Um, it's not, you're not going to get an Andrew Ruiz, that's the reality of it. But you can get similar and you can work on things. But I don't think, you know, I've ever preferred a fighter for a professional fighter who's had identical sparring partner to who he's fighting. And the fight's very different from sparring anyway. Sparring's a training exercise that... You know, you've got to try and get the tactics working in the spars so that you can then carry them into the fight. But there'll be similar fighters to Ruiz in sparring, but there's not going to be an Andy Ruiz. If there was, we'd have got him in. Now, with the fight taking place in Saudi Arabia as well, Rob, what was your thoughts on that being the location chosen? I think, look, it's a neutral venue. Um, 
you know, Wales was suggested. I'm not sure they were over keen on coming to Wales, uh, Ruiz's team, and certainly we. What, Ruiz's team were not keen on coming to Wales, but they'll go to Saudi Arabia. Fucking hell. They jump out of the mouth, don't they? They jump out of the mouth. We wasn't over keen on going to the States, so it's a neutral venue. It's it's just, you know, recently staged a big fight, so. Um, it's neutral, we'll see how we go, and you know, it's, an, it's a fantastic opportunity for Anthony Joshua to reclaim his titles, and obviously Ruiz will have different ideas, but it's a huge fight, so you know, focus on the sport and the actual fight, and that's, that's, that's where we're at with it. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on some criticisms that were thrown your way for the first time, that I've seen since you've been working with AJ. You know, it's not the first time, it's been for, consistent for a long time, it was the same when I was working with Carl Froch. Um, this is what you get in professional boxing. It's, it's, you know, the reality is, is it's ultimately money based, and um, you know, people have, you know, their ideas, their agendas, and you know, their gripes and their grievances. So, uh, well, he's certainly right there. Look, I thought you were going to say boxing's a business then, but people have their own agendas. Look, in my opinion, right, the ideal scenario for Joshua, right, would be. To cut, if I had Joshua, right, if I had Joshua, right, this is what I'd do, right, forget Dennis, and we're talking me, if I'm promoting Joshua or he's, if I'm his manager or whatever, this is what I'd do, I won't fight Ruiz again, right, I'd come back to England, and I'd just have a couple of fights in England, and that, then there's a year gone by then, isn't there, right, now, Julio Cesar Chavez, right, were gifted a win against Meldrick Taylor by Richard Steele, who's Don King's pet ref. Now, Julio Cesar Chavez, he didn't get, he, he didn't rematch Meldrick Taylor straight away, did he? Because he had to get over the, the, the first fight they had. What he did, he let Taylor have a few more fights, win a world title, and, uh, he then let Taylor fight him and uh, he stopped him, didn't he? He got him at the right time now. Joshua, if he had half a brain in his head, instead of being greedy, what he would have done, he would have he would have gone and had a, another couple of fights against somebody else, wasn't he? Against other guys, lesser opponents, probably Dillian White. I mean, that's probably an hard fight for him now, actually, because Dillian's a better fighter. And I'd make Dillian White, actually, against Joshua. I'd make that a Dillian White. Oof. I'd say it's a 50 50 fight, but I'd go with Dillian White on that. I wouldn't. I'm not saying that because Mark Tibbs is a good pal of mine. I'm not. I'm saying it for the simple reason that I think Joshua's come down in, in I think he's on slide now and I don't think his skill set's as good as Dillian's. I thought when he were knocking everybody out, Joshua up to fighting Charlie Martin, nobody could cope with his speed and uh how quick he got the job done. Now since he's stepped up to these tougher fights well it's the same tougher fights I thought he were I thought he were exposed against Vladimir, but I think that since then Joshua has been found wanting in certain areas, and as my friend Terry Chapandama says, his skill set isn't as good as what they think it is. I mean Joshua's skill set, right? It's a three out of ten. He's an English level skill set, but he's just he's like what Dave Allen said to me about him. He said, "Do you know what, Russ?" He's just an athlete. He could he could have probably turned his hand to anything when he left school, any sport if he'd have wanted to. He's that much of an athlete. You know, he does 100 metres in 11 seconds, doesn't he? Um, you know, he played football. You know, soccer, they call it in America. He could have probably played rugby. He's a big, strong, fast lad, isn't he? He could have probably been a bodybuilder. He could have probably been a weightlifter. You know, if he'd have took all right supplements. You know, all them kind of things. And, you know, he, he probably could have even played cricket as well. He'd probably been a good beer fielder or a fast bowler. You know, he, he could release the ball from his hand and his hand could be like Joel Garner's used to be. His hand would be above the sight screen. So by the time the batsman sees it, 
it's like he sees it that fraction later. That's why Joel Garner were unplayable to some guys. Now, looking at it as I look at it, that's what I'd have done. I'd have took him away, got him a couple of wins, got him back to the Joshua that we know, and got them wins in England and got the crowd back on, back on, back on his side. Whereas at the moment they've gone to America for the money, right? They've gone to America for the money and they got licked. They've now gone to Saudi for more money and they're going to get licked again. So where does he go then? Does he come back to England with his tail between his legs? Do we all welcome him home with open arms? And does Eddie Earn pop up on Sky saying, it's the homecoming, it's the homecoming? And all that, do they start spinning that script? Because what you've got here, Robert McCracken here, and I know Robert McCracken, right? I've met Robert McCracken. Robert McCracken is his trainer. Now, Robert McCracken had Joshua from day one. They knew they could have had a Frank Bruno on. Now, any trainer who get who gets somebody like Joshua, who's in heavyweight, and has got a bit of a story, they're all thinking, we've got a Frank Bruno, we? we've got a Frank Bruno, but... They're all, they were all saying when they got him, we've got a Frank Bruno here, and if he, he can engage and get a profile, we've got a Frank Bruno here, but with the devil in him. Frank didn't have the devil in him, did he? He was a nice guy, wasn't he? He fluked to world title against Oliver McCall, which were more or less down to Frank Warren's relationship with Don King. That you beat Oliver McCall, you definitely rematch Mike Tyson. But the best belt in the world, the WBC belt, the belt that Joshua were working towards, the WBC belt, Joshua were mandatory for Wilder, what did he go and do? The mandatory were going to come up, what did he do? He jumped ship, didn't he, to IBF. Yeah, they could say they got Charlie Martin in that, but let me tell you this, Joshua were already a millionaire before he fought Charlie Martin, already a millionaire. See where I'm coming from? He was worth more than one million pounds before he fought Charlie Martin. So he's a millionaire before he fights for world title. So what's the problem? What is the problem? He's already a millionaire. He could have learned his craft and then gone after Wilder. Got the best belt. Because there's only one belt that counts in boxing and that's the WBC belt. That's the belt that everybody wants. The green and gold belt. What did he go and do? He went and got the third tier belt, didn't he? Ended up with a third tier belt against a seventh tier opponent. He didn't want to get the other two belts, did he? The WBC and the WBA, the, long, the, the longest belts. I think the WBA is longer than the WBC, isn't it? Or, but the WBC is known as the best belt and it? it's been going over 50 years. Now, as far as I'm concerned, he didn't want to do that. But all these that they're wheeling out here, all they want to do... He's earned all the Joshua's big business. If Louise pulls out this fight, the show's still going to go ahead. Show must go on. Look, the show is still going to go ahead. Now, as far as I'm concerned, now, right, as far as I'm concerned, all these people around Joshua, you Robert McCracken, isn't them? They're all getting paid, aren't they? They're all getting paid. I mean, Robert McCracken here, he'll be loving it. Look, he's already had teeth done. He's had teeth at lot and lot. These people are on the big gravy train. It's the Joshua Express, and the next stop's Saudi. And they need this win to do this world tour, what they're going to do. Now, whatever happened to Joshua saying he wants to fight in Nigeria? I mean, Freddie Cunningham, he went out to Nigeria, didn't he? With that... Who is it? The guy with the... Uh, I forgot his name now. Look, they went out to Nigeria. They were speaking to them. They were speaking to New York. They were speaking to Vegas. Now, Joshua was saying Nigeria is where he wants to fight. There is people. So he started spinning that story. But what happened? Well, we know what happened, don't we? The Saudi money came in and all of a sudden... Being the man of the people and Mr. Nigeria, now that didn't matter, did it? Same as winning the belt back in New York where it all went wrong. He wanted to put it right there. Whatever happened to putting it right in New York, eh? Well, that didn't happen, did it? Once that Saudi money came, 
It were all systems go, wasn't it? Whatever happened to coming back to London? For the fans. This is where it's at, UK. You and my kind of people. Everything that Joshua said after they beat uh, Povetkin, what did he say in the ring? For the fans. For the fans. Well, the fans who want to travel now, 1880 quid I saw a ticket for today. £1,880 flight. Alright. Whole package with a ticket in hotel. £3,145. £3,145. You won't need much spend though because you can only drink Iron Brew. Or Tizer or Lilt. With a totally tropical taste. What do you think to that, Eddie? £3,145. So I'll need a bit of money to get to airport and I'll need a bit of spender while I'm over there. So we're looking at about three and a half thousand pound with a bit of spendo. So can you lend me that three and a half thousand, Eddie? Because I'm poor as a church mouse. Hey? Eh? For the fans, Eddie. Eddie, three thousand four hundred and forty-five pound. For the fans, Eddie. Eddie for fans. Yeah, what about Kel Brook and Amir Khan, Eddie? For fans. For the fans. All I want to hear about, Eddie, is stuff that you're putting on. For the fans. That's what we want. We want stuff, Eddie, for the fans because that's what matters. Do you know what I mean? For the fans. But they're not going to listen to me, are they? All I'm going to do is just keep banging it home and banging it home and banging that drum. Until one day a load of people start listening to me. And they start saying, do you know what, Porky? Uh, do you know what, Porky? You were right. You were right, Porky, about Eddie Earn. He doesn't care about anybody. He's bailed out of boxing. They made a quarter of a billion him and his dad made a quarter of a billion in ten years and they bailed out boxing. They only want to be in boxing now if they've got the proper boxers around them, but I don't know. It's all pointing towards a bailout in it, but who knows? Uh, who's to say that Dazone aren't, aren't the real deal? Who's to say that the Dazone aren't the, aren't the real deal? Do you know what I mean? I can't even have a sat there on my own here. Uh, it's got to be oh, it's got to be uh, no older than five year old. I don't want no older than five year old. So that's it. So it's got to have had just two MOTs. If it's got more than two MOTs on it, I don't want to know. So all right. So it's got to be five year old or under. Cause don't the, yeah, I don't want anything old. All right, and Ed Gaskets go on then as well. So all right. But, uh, sorry about that, but getting back to uh, to Joshua, look, it's a money business, isn't it? It's like, it's like they say, in it? It's a business, isn't it? These people want to get paid. They've got families. If they can do a smash and grab, they're going to do it. If McCracken can get massive amounts of money out of uh, Joshua, he's going to do it, isn't it? Well, my queue's ready. Uh, so, Joshua's not bothered, is he, really? What he's going to do, he's just going to pick up his paychecks and plod on. But like I said, Robert McCracken here, he's, he's got a lot of respect from me for what he did for Carl Froch. But Robert McCracken's, he's a family man. He's got his missus, he's got kids. Do you know what I mean? He's got a lot of properties to maintain now. He's a very, very rich man. And he's done well out of the job, let me tell you. Robert McCracken has done very, very well. And let me tell you this, Robert McCracken 
owes a big debt of thanks to Mick Hennessy. Massive, massive favours Mick Hennessy's done for him. But Mick Hennessy's he's not strong. He's not mentally strong. He does a lot of favours for people and he gets shit on, doesn't he? But let me tell you this. Mick Hennessy took Robert McCracken from being on Skid Row to putting him in putting him in the boxing business and he stayed with Mick years. And obviously they went the separate ways, didn't they, not long ago, but let me tell you this. Mick Hennessy is the top guy. Robert McCracken, he's not daft. He's been around boxing all his life. He he will win Mickey Duff. He knows that every now and then you get a Frank Bruno or you get a Joshua. Right? You get people like this and you've got to milk him while you can because these fighters will capture the imagination and a generation of people. They only come along every so often now. Eddie could end up having an Olympian next year, signing a gold medal Olympian in Fraser Clark. He could win Olympics next summer. But I can assure you that Fraser Clark, he might not capture with public's imagination like Joshua has. He might not, and Fraser's a good a good fighter. Me and Dennis are big, massive Fraser Clark fans. But Fraser Clark, even though he's a nice kid and he's a good fighter, he might not he might not win a world title. They might not capture everybody's imagination like Joshua did. Joshua timed it right with the Olympics, with the NBE. He palped royal family up. He's done everything right. He's done it all for PR. He's been seen with the right people and been on the right sort of TV shows, he's been manufactured from day one but he come up against a guy in Andy Ruiz whose skill set were a lot better than his Robert McCracken, here we are, him here, he's been around boxing all his life he knows that he, there's nothing he can do about Ruiz's skill set there's nothing at all that Robert McCracken can do about it so all they're going to do is just hope that he don't get caught again and they're going to keep it long and they're going to play it safe like they did with Parker. Joseph Parker had a lot had a lot going for him against Joshua but he didn't he didn't use those attributes Joshua used his. Although every time Parker tried to use them the referee ruined it. But let's hope that the Ruiz gets a fair shake out there but I want I want Joshua to win. I want him to come back and I want him to go stay in England and keep build boxing again. But somehow, I think that along the line, Joshua's promoter, Eddie Hearn, has upset that many people and they've upset a lot of casuals. Now, Eddie Hearn employs people to monitor the numbers on YouTube and social media. And I know a little bit about this because you have to invest in proper software now People out there who think I'm bullshitting, well, you think that all along. But the people out there who know a bit about computers and software and things like that, they will tell you that if you invest in the right stuff, you can find out all sorts about the numbers game. Now, Eddie Yearn, he'll have the same stuff that what we've got, or even better. And they will know it's a numbers game. Right? They'll know that the numbers have been dropping off with Joshua. They will know. Why do you think they went to New York? Why do you think they don't want to come back to England? Because they know that they've lost a bit of their audience. They've probably lost a third of their audience. That's why they're having to make that money up by going out to Saudi. They're still beating the drum saying Joshua's Ali and best thing since sliced bread. But, uh, do you know what I mean? But, like I said, I think the bubble's about to burst. Do you know what I mean? But it is what it is, isn't it? It's a business, like I've said before. It's a business. But what can you do? It's uh what what can you do? It's just one of them things, isn't it? It's just one of them things. Do you know what I mean? But Nobody's saying that Joshua's not a great fighter, but Tyson Fury would just play with him like a cat, wouldn't he? With a ball of wool. And then he, Joshua would probably blow a gasket late on it, fight Tyson and take him out. That's what I think he'd do. He'd have a puncher's chance against him, but nobody punches as hard as Wilder and Tyson gets up, doesn't he? So I don't see Tyson Fury getting beat as an heavyweight. And I see Tyson Fury at the moment as the best fighter in the world. But 
he hasn't got any belts. He's got not got a belt and he's fighting Dossers. Andy Ruiz is the man. He's got four belts. Wilder's number two. He's got a belt. And then you probably have to put Tyson Fury there on achievements at number three. Then you'd have to put... Well, I know it's a tough one now, isn't it? Who would you put in fourth? Gillian White? Ergovic? I don't know. Ergovic don't get a mention, does he? Another thing, another person who don't get a mention. Caballel. Why doesn't Caballel get a mention? Caballel is a great fighter. He is a great fighter. Caballel. He's a top, top fighter. Now... It is what it is, isn't it? But he, he never gets a mention. He never gets a mention whatsoever, but... I'm sure that Caballel is, on Ed, Ed, is in Eddie Hearn's fault, thoughts all the time. But the moral of the story with boxing is this. If you want to get on with Eddie Hearn, you've got to have a profile. Now, Dave Allen took that to a T. Dave Allen got it down to a T, his profile. And he'll always be with Sky. And Matchroom, Dave Allen. Now, I, I heard yesterday off some reels connected to Eddie Hearn that they're not bothered if Dave Allen's got 10 defeats. He's still going to be on at Sky, so good luck to Dave Allen. Chisora's not got a profile like Dave Allen, and he's had nine defeats, has he, or ten? So Chisora's not got a profile like that, has he? But he gets big fights, doesn't he? And Dave Allen will always be in big fights, but he could do he, uh, getting a proper trainer in Dave Allen and learning some defence. He could probably do it going back to Peter Fury and learning how to move his head. That's what David needs to do. Do you know what I mean? But it is what it is, isn't it? It's one of them things, isn't it? It's boxing, isn't it? It's the hardest sport in the world, inside and outside. Do you know what I mean? But what can you do? What can you do? It's just one of them things. But anyway, let's listen to the rest of McCracken. It's it's irrelevant to me, you know. No, you know, if somebody was in the camps or actually saw him training or see me, saw me working with him and coaching him then maybe they could be objective, but they're just taking a snap emotional decision on somebody losing a fight, blame everybody, and in, and in my case it was, in, well, in small, some case it was blame the trainer, which is, do me a favour. A lot of rumours were floating about that you might look to bring somebody in. Were you looking to work with somebody else in camp? Well, I don't know where these rumours come from. He's always worked with a variety of people. I'm his head coach. I lead, I lead his, his, his fights. I do the corner and I set the strategies and, you know, I'm at his sessions and oversee them. But we've always worked with lots of different coaches and, you know, we'll work with two or three in this camp. And, you know, Ben Guru's cousin helps coach him as well. So I just think people get caught up in this, you know, let's try and... Try and I don't know, find a reason why, you know, Ruiz is a good fighter and let's not forget that and it's, uh, I don't know. Look, he's not telling, what, 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 what Robert McCracken is doing here, right, is, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, what I wanted is, I wanted the cue straightening, so, because when you roll it on the, on the snooker table, it's supposed to go, it's supposed to go across the table, in it, right? So uh, what I want you to do is straighten it. It's a 1947 Q. Straighten it. If you can't change colour on it, I'm not bothered. But straighten it. And I also wanted uh, wanted a 10 mil tip because it's 10.5 mil in it, the tip on it. Now that's how they had them in the 1940s because they played billiards, didn't they? And the balls were heavier. Now I want a 10 mil tip or 9.85. And just give it a rub down on that. A new ferrule on it. It had a, it had a, a threaded ferrule on it. I just... It takes away a little bit from Ruiz. He's a fantastic fighter. He's dangerous. It's not about physic about the physical look of a fighter. Heavyweight boxing, time and time again we've seen that. It's just that Ruiz is quick and dangerous and he's a good hooker. And he landed on the night too many times and he got the win. AJ's got to stop him doing that. Um, he'll, be he'll be fully prepared for the rematch, Anthony, and it's one he's looking forward to. And, you know, what a great chance to get your titles back, and you know, in some cases you never get that chance again. Some people have spoken about if AJ was to lose, where does he go? Is that the end of Anthony Joshua if he was to lose? Uh, I bet you any money that McCracken turns around now and says he'll still fight on. They want him out there. 
if Joshua don't fight again, they've lost their jobs. They've lost their meal ticket. All the free stuff that he's going to get doing two fights a year with Joshua. Now these people have been dreaming about earning multi-millions because the talk was when Joshua won the title in his 17th fight, everybody said, right, we're going to win, we're going to beat Marciano's record, we're going to have 33 world title fights. We we're going to have 33 more fights. That's what they were going to do, right? Can you imagine the money that these people would have been on? 33, Joshua would have had 30, Joshua would have had something like about half a billion pounds and McCracken would have had 10% of that, 50 million. Watch what he says here, I don't even, I ain't seen this, listen to this now. Um, well, I wouldn't have thought so, but what I would say is, is uh, you know, what we that? wouldn't have took the rematch if we don't think... In the Benson Joshua, if he was to lose... Some people have spoken about if AJ was to lose, where does he go? Is that the end of Anthony Joshua if oh. he was to lose? Come on. Um, well, I wouldn't have thought so, but what I would say is, is uh, you know, we wouldn't have took the rematch if we don't think he could win the rematch. The whole the whole team thinks he can win the rematch. Uh, he thinks he can win the rematch, which is the most important thing because, you know, ultimately, he's the boss in Right, so Joshua can win the rematch. On what evidence have we seen from Joshua's skill set, the Terry Chapendama's words, not mine, he uses the word skill set. What evidence have we seen regarding Joshua's skill set that says he can beat Ruiz? He's not as fast as Ruiz. He's, he's hit Ruiz with his hardest punch and he got up. Ruiz hit Joshua and he made him quit. So... What skill set has Joshua got and what has he shown us that he can beat Ruiz? Let's listen to this from, this is Joshua's trainer for the last 10 years. Professional boxing, I think people forget and start saying, oh, this probably, Anthony Joshua's his own boss, he runs his own ship, that's the reality of it. And anybody that works for Anthony or works around him, he employs them to do a job. So he's in charge, he makes the decisions ultimately, he's not told by anybody what to do. He asked for my advice and he asked a few other people their advice, but um, he's driven to try and get the, get the titles back. And, you know, where would you be in heavyweight boxing if people didn't want to fight each other again? If they lost, you'd be nowhere. On the other side of the coin, some people said as well that, you know, like AJ himself said in interviews that he kind of maybe lacked that little bit of motivation when he fought Andrews Jr. because he didn't have the fights that he wanted. If things were to go to plan, would he have to fight one of those big names like Tyson Fury, John Taylor, to keep that motivation? I think time's gone on and he, I just think that all that matters is Andy Ruiz. I think those fights are irrelevant. If Anthony doesn't beat Andy Ruiz, those fights will never happen. They're totally irrelevant. You know, Anthony's got to worry about what he's got to do and what he's got on his plate, and Ruiz is certainly more, enough for anyone to handle. That's all that matters. You know, if Anthony can get his titles back against Ruiz, I'm sure he'll, he'll relax and have a breather for a bit. Certainly, he's not thinking about anyone else, he's only thinking about boxing Ruiz. Finally, because I know you've got someone waiting for you and you want to shoot off, and you've had enough of me. Next weekend, Tyson Fury faces Otto Wallin, Otto Wallin for Anthony Joshua in the amateurs. What, you, what do you know about Otto that you can share with us and how do you see that fight playing out? Yeah, Otto's a tricky side boy, he knows what he's doing. What the fucking hellfire, Robert? What are you, what, Robert? What are you coming out with now? Why are they, what, what is he coming out with now? Robert McCracken, and not many people know this, but Tyson Fury was trained by Huey Fury. Huey Fury trained him when he started, he sadly passed, on, passed away. Uh, Robert McCracken trained him for one fight and Peter Fury and now Ben Davidson so Huey Fury, Robert McCracken, Peter Fury Ben Davidson, Tyson Fury's on his fourth trainer now Robert's his former trainer right he trained him for one camp and one fight right the rumours are that Tyson Fury could end up at Macho now should he fall out with Van Davidson down the line, would Robert McCracken train him again? Yes, he would. And what a reversal reversal of fortunes that would be for Tyson, wouldn't it? He lost all his belts because of politics. Joshua mopped up all his belts without beating a champion. He got them belts given him. 
and all the adulation and all the millions now it's all turned full circle now Tyson's getting the millions Joshua's lost his belt if Joshua gets beat up next time and retires McCracken's out of job Tyson slips in at matchroom gets all his belts back gets his former trainer back and he gets Joshua's trainer while Joshua's on the sidelines and then they build that fight up for Joshua's comeback why not why not Joshua's got the profile Eddie Hearn's never ever gonna let it go never gonna let that go that Joshua can always be there to fight even if he retires Eddie will always want him back but you never know I could have a vivid imagination but let's see what Robert's got to say here for the last 10 seconds um, but um, so obviously Tyson's a different level and Tyson will win comfortably Rob thanks for his box social why didn't Robert McCracken just turn around there and say, look, Otto Wallin is a fucking load of shit and Tyson should be ashamed of himself. But they can't, can they? Because down the line, Robert McCracken, he's only 50, Robert McCracken will be thinking, you know what, I could be a trainer in another 20 year here and my opportunity could come up to train Tyson Fury. So he's not going to come in and say what he really wants to say, but I can assure you, behind closed doors Robert McCracken will be pissing his pants at Tyson Fury's opponents now Robert McCracken's trained Tyson for one fight when he was working under Mick Hennessy Banner, Banner Tyson Mick got Robert McCracken in as trainer and uh, Tyson respects Rob but what can Robert McCracken teach Tyson he can't teach him anything can he motivate him no, I think Ben Davison's doing a go good job motivating him. Uh, is Ben Davison a fantastic coach? Well, it remains to be seen now, doesn't it? Nobody's turned pro with Ben Davison and done anything yet, have they? But, you know, if he can keep Tyson fit and motivated, that's a job in itself. So, he's undefeated with Tyson, so... I think we can judge Ben Davidson once they've actually won something. Alright? But McCracken's been there, hasn't he? With Joshua and Froch from the debuts. And obviously they've won world titles, haven't they? So he's been there and done it, hasn't he? So we can't question Robert McCracken. But Robert McCracken went on to say early on in this interview that Joshua's always been surrounded by people. Well, somebody's got to take the blame. Somebody has to be accountable for his performance against Andy Ruiz. Now, if Robert McCracken isn't accountable, who is? Who is responsible for the Anthony Joshua meltdown in the ring in front of the whole world? Who's responsible for that? Is it Joshua? Is it Robert McCracken? Who is responsible? Nobody's mentioning a word at the moment, are they? They're all saying where well, they got caught on top of his, off on top of his equilibrium, and he and he never got he never he never recovered. Well, fair enough. Carl Froch didn't recover against George Groves. Carl Froch didn't recover against George Groves until seventh round. Eight. Seventh, eighth round. I think it was about eighth round. He started to feel all right. The Groves beat him that bad that it, it, it cleared his head and we're hitting him that hard and that's a true story and trust me I know now it is what it is isn't it but the bottom line is this Anthony Joshua is fighting in Saudi Arabia after saying he wanted it in New York because that's where it went wrong and then said it were England because he didn't want the fans to be paying too much and he loves his fans he's now going to be fighting in December Joshua's going to be fighting in December that's what he's going to be doing but that's not good is it so Chris Eubank Sr born in 1966 he retired age 31 All right. age 31 and were his last fight against Carl Thompson he beat Nigel Benn, right, at the age of 24. He beat Nigel Benn 
Nigel Gregory Ben at Birmingham Exhibition Centre for the WBO middleweight title in November 1990 age 24 now after that fight right, he went on he went on a massive run he drew with Ray Close and he drew with Nigel Ben but he went on a run where he was defeated by Steve Collins right. he then had two quick fights now what Barry Hearn did Barry Hearn knew right this is where you've got to get into the mindset of these promoter people Barry Hearn knew that they'd been on a massive run with Steve Collins and they'd had it all their own way in all these fights they'd had I mean the Ray Close one was a joke the Ray Close one were farcical but Chris Eubank were massive news then with a new sanctioning body the WBO that he should have been disqualified against Ray Close in Scotland that night and he got beat in the Nigel Ben rematch everybody knows that it were a farce and they gave it as a draw they took a point off Ben didn't they which was shocking now his best win in my opinion was the one in Germany where he beat a guy 35-0 and in Germany now Barry Yearn got massive money to go over there and he was basically he thought Eubank were finished so he were cashing him in but he managed to pull a win off over there and that for me is his best win not the Nigel Ben one that one's his best win he beat Lyndall Holmes as well that's another good one Jimmy Nez that's another good one now Chris Eubank only fought 52 fights altogether but you've got to understand that he went on a massive run a massive run now this is the point I'm trying to make of the look that he had all the way through he beat Nigel Ben now he thumbed Nigel Ben in eye but stuff like that happens Dan Sherry that were a gift Gary Stretch was a gift these were all Barry Hearn matchups Michael Watson won they were robbed Watson were robbed in that fight the rematch Rob Watson beat him up but he, he got caught in here end around 11 and got finished in 12 Thelaney Malinga I thought he lost that fight but he squeaked on on a split decision John Jarvis Ron Esser and Tony Thornton the postman not very good Jimmy Nez not a bad win Linda Holmes a great win Ray Close draw that was shocking that it should have been disqualified the Nigel Ben draw now this is where Barry Hearn thought it were all over for him so they went out to Germany they got massive money to fight in Germany and Chris Eubank won a unanimous decision against Graciano Rocci Rocciani he then had the Ray Close rematch that were a split decision in Belfast now he got massive money to go out to Belfast for that fight yet again we've got Barry Hearn not putting a show on he didn't put the show on in Belfast now what had happened at this stage of the game the fans had turned against Eubank then we've got Mauricio Amarel that were in Kensington Sam Story were in Cardiff I mean how on earth he got a title shot I don't know Dan Sommer he was 30 and 0 we a draw uh, that were a unanimous decision that were in South Africa Henry Wharton beat Henry Wharton that were a good win for him now the Steve Collins fight they fought that in Ireland right that were in Ireland Barry Hearn lost the purse bid for that Frank Warren won it so he got beat in Ireland now he's got a deal with Barry Hearn at the moment Eubank so what does he do what does Barry Hearn do though Barry Hearn is like he's going to pass everything on to his dad now what you've got here with Joshua is this Joshua the Joshua concept is going to be like the Chris Eubank senior concept they want to go on a long run and milk it do a bit of a world tour or just pull wool over fans eyes if they can get other people to put the shows on they're going to do that aren't they because you just pick up the cheque don't you from TV company just sit back and enjoy the evening 
Steve Collins beat him in the first one. So Barry Yearn, he went straight out there. Two months later, he's got Eubank out again. Two months later, in Belfast. Two months after that, he's fighting at Whitley Bay in the northeast against Jose Ignacio Barrio Tabina. What on earth is that? I don't know. So he's had two quick knockouts, and then he's ready for Collins rematch. Now they ended up fighting in Cork for the rematch. Now, as far as I'm concerned, he lost that fight. Should have never been a split decision. I thought he lost it comfortably, like he, like he did the first one. Collins were fresher. Eubank had got miles on the clock. Now we've got a 31 year old guy, <clears throat> 31 years of age. We're getting on for 400 rounds in bank. 400 rounds, how many rounds he's done? 393 rounds he's done, right? And Eubank's one of them, he's not a massive puncher, he can punch but he's not massive. Look, only 44% KO ratio. Now, he got beat against Collins in rematch, right? So what's he do then? What does he do then? He tries to reinvent himself. But you've heard, you've heard Eddie Hearn, haven't you? Eddie Hearn came out in that interview on IFL. And what did Eddie Hearn say? What did Eddie Hearn say? Eddie Hearn said, ah, he did his conkers in. My dad said, you're nuts. Now, they've come to the end of their deal. Steve Collins. Uh, Barry Hearn and Chris Eubank Sr. have come to the end of the deal. He's lost his world title. The run's come to an end. Uh, the run has come to an end. It's 1995. And Chris Eubank Sr., a multi-millionaire at the time, is 29 years of age. 29 years of age. Just turned 29. Right. And he's got no deal with Barry Hearn. Barry Hearn was the best man at his wedding and he's, he's turned his back on him. So Eubank, in his wisdom, promotes himself. Now, this is how you look. I remember all these. Look, he doesn't tell you who promoted it. Look, he promoted himself in Egypt, in Cairo, Egypt. Look, there's, there's the show there. Look, it was on my birthday, October the 19th. Now, my birthday the year later is when he fought Carl Zaghi. Look, he put a show on with just three fights on it. It was a disaster. A total disaster. Now, let's see if it tells you more in the bout. No, it doesn't tell you much. Doesn't tell you much. But it was light heavyweight. Now, he lost the fight. Fair enough. Unlucky. He lost on my birthday. But it didn't deter him. But what he did... He came back again. He fought in Dubai this time. Now, look, it doesn't tell you who put the show on, but it's three fights again. Right, let's see if it tells you a bit about it in the bout. Nope, doesn't tell you. It just says it's at a tennis club in Dubai. So Chris Eubank, he's a, his best man at his wedding with Barry Earn. They've been together since, let's have a look. So he started fighting in America to start with, didn't he? Let's have a look when he first got with Barry Hearn. Let's have a look. And his first fight with Baza. No, DMC Promotions. Let's have a look. Uh, not with that one. Let's have a look if it's this one. Mickey Duff. No. Mickey Duff, let's have a look. Let's have a look when we're the first first Baza one. Here we go. This will be Baza's one. 1989. June. There you go, Barry Earn. Barry Earns, there you go. Brentwood, nice and steady. Don't know him. Don't know him from Adam. Let's have a look. If it's that one. Let's 
Oh no, oh, is that Barry had one before? I'm in shock there, let's have a look. Well, let's go, let's start trying, let's do a job properly. Right, so Brentwood, your call. Kensington Royal Albert Hall. I don't think that, I think that's a Mickey Duff venue, that, and Anthony Logan. Don't tell you. Nigel Ben, that's a Frank Warren show. Johnny Melfer. Oh my God, Chris Eubank on undercard. Nigel Ben against Michael Shilamba. Shilamba. Right, so we know that he got around, in, we know it's around about the 80s where, end of the 80s where he's got in touch with Barry Hearn. So Barry Hearn, basically. It looks like it was that one then. Looks like that was the first one. So it looks like the your call one. No, not that one. Right, let's have a look. So the your call one was the first promoted Barry Hearn one, yeah. Chris Eubank headlining against Randy Smith. And then you've got two, four, six, two, six fights on at your call. 1989, May. Didn't Nigel Ben lose his title round about that time to uh, at Finsbury Park? I'm sure he did to Michael Watson. So 1989. So Barry Hearn has had Chris Eubank from 89 until 95. So six year. In that six year, they've earned millions of pounds. Uh, Eddie said eight figures, that's ten million. So he's earned money, and he? So he's a millionaire. And he were blowing through money like there's no tomorrow. So 19, 1995, they've parted company. He said, I want to do a deal in Cairo. There's a lot of opportunities. And Barry Hearn said, you're fucking mad. They read his words. Right, so they've gone to Cairo. So it hadn't worked out. So that means they're done then. Right. So six years, in six and a half years, six, seven year, the partnership's dissolved, right? The best man at the wedding, the brothers from another mother, on all that load of crap, it's all gone. So you've got to get into the mindset. Barry Earn is a businessman. Chris Eubank is, is no good to him no more. So all that, you know best man at wedding and godfather to kids and all that it's all a load of rubbish it doesn't mean anything does it unless you're lining these people's profits you see barry hearn can't control chris eubank he's eccentric but he can control people like steve davis because steve davis he's no match for barry hearn is he whereas christopher you christopher livingston eubank Christopher Livingston, Eubanks, with an S on end, but he, but he prefers it as Eubank. Christopher Livingston, Eubanks, who were born a couple of weeks after England won World Cup in England, he can't be controlled, so he has two fights, Cairo in Egypt and the, the tennis club in Dubai, wins them both by knockouts, cost of dossers, loses a fortune, doesn't make a penny on the shows, he then fights Joe Calzaghi, gets beat against Joe Calzaghi. Frank Warren wants to rub his nose in it even more, tells him to move up to Cruiserweight, gets him bashed up. So after leaving Barry Hearn, he's gone two wins and three losses and he's finished. Right, he's finished. He took a bad beating in the last one. He then hates boxing and blah de blah, blah. Well, fair enough. But leading up to that, when he, when he lost against Steve Collins in 95... That was basically it, really. That was basically it. But like I said, Barry Hearn wheeled him out in Ireland, you know, on, on, a, on a decent enough sort of show, trying to cash in. He thought that was the end of it. And he said, you know what, Chris, we'll get another one out. So he gets Chris out again. I mean, this is a guy, right, who over a short period of time... Has had a lot of miles on the a lot of miles put on the clock. Now people might say I'm being picky at the Hearns here. I'm not. I'm going to show you something now that's going to make your eyes pop out. From Nigel Ben fight the first fight in 1990. 1990 against Ben. 
right from 1990 right to 1995 to Collins doing him right that's one two three four five six seven eight down to Amaral 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So basically, 23 fights, it were all over for Chris Eubank. From, from beating Nigel Benn for the belt at middleweight to stepping up to super middle against Michael Watson in the rematch from the middleweight fight he's had 23 fights in them 23 fights as soon as he lost against Collins them two losses he's got 19 wins 19 wins and then he's had two losses of Collins and two draws that were it then it were all over Barry Ian didn't want to play ball with him they threw him out against two more he got two more shows out of him where he didn't have to pay an opponent, you know, any money. Uh, these fights here in between the Goduff, whatever he's called in Belfast, and the Baratabina, right? Them two fights, no titles online, no sanctioning body, bodies to pay. Still got a big profile. They threw him out twice, right? So 23 fights there. But look in the short period of time, how many of them 23 fights he'd had. In five years, in five years, under five year, four year, ten month, from 95 September, going back to November 90. Four year, ten month, 23 world title fights in four year, ten month. That is unbelievable. Now watch what happens now when I go to Anthony Joshua. Watch what happens now. Where am I here? Hang on a minute. Where are we at? What? Stay still. Right, Anthony Joshua. Anthony Joshua. Right. Anthony Joshua. So Christopher Eubank, four year, ten month. He had twenty three world title fights with Hearn. We're not talking about the ones with Warren after, we're talking with the Hearns. Now, Andy Ruiz. Right, this is where I'm gonna do the average. I'm gonna average it out. Let me get my pen. Oh, I might even have a Right. So Anthony Joshua, his last fight with Andy Ruiz, and his next fight is is Andy Ruiz, and that's going to be in December. So let's have a look how many he's had. So he started out with Charlie Martin, right? Charlie Martin, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and the tenth fight will be in December. There you go, 10th fight. So, Charlie Martin, 16, April 16. So, it's three year, three year, eight months. So, three year, eight months, three year, eight months. How many months is that? 36 add eight. 44 months, 44 months, right? And Eubanks is 4, 8 to 48 out of 10 in 58 months. And how many, how many Eubank had? So Joshua's will be 10. So that's 4, so that's a 44 month, 4 months, 4.4, isn't it? And his is 23, isn't it, Eubanks? Hurry on, I need calculator for that. I need calculator. Uh, calculator. Hang on a minute. Oh, Jesus. Uh, calculator. Rocky, would you up there? Because I think we might be onto something here. Some a bit. Some analysation. Right. 
I get these things in my head and I have to see them through. Right, I think it's about two a month, is it? 58 month. Oh, I on, calculator. Cal Q later. Right. 58, 58 share by 23 world title fights equals. Right. 2.58 2.52 right so basically this is what we're talking about now then right basically this is what we're, this is what we're chatting right Anthony Joshua right Anthony Joshua as been fighting world title fights under match room with Eddie Hearn every 4.4 months so that's so they're squeezing three out a year aren't they right every 13 months Joshua has three world title fights Chris Eubanks fighting every he's just like he's basically he's fighting twice as many fights isn't he now at the time Barry Hearn had a lot of financial problems at the time, he had massive amounts of problems, he cashed Herbie Hyde in, right, I want to show you something now, not a lot of people know this, this is why you've got to say Barry Hearn is a bit of a genius, but they're also, he's also a slave master isn't he, now, a lot of people might not, not like me for coming out and pointing this out, but it's all there online, right, Herbie Hyde, Right, ABI, look, he won the world title against Michael Bent. There you go, can you see it? You see that? Michael Bent, world title, WBO world title at Millwall, and Barry Hearn said he was the second coming of Ali, even better. Right, first defence, Riddick Bow, Las Vegas. There you go. Lost by KO. There you go. Rock Newman show. There you go. Lost. Rock Newman. Riddick Bow. There you go. Cora Sanders on his second and his third fight. Right. ABI. There you go. So ABI 26 and 0. Riddick Bow. He'd already been beat by Holyfield. Although he beat Holyfield another two times. So Herbie Hyde. Herbie Hyde wasn't given the same chance that Anthony Joshua was given. Now people can say, oh, you're obsessed by the Hearns and this and that. No, I'm not obsessed by them. I'm just pointing out to you that I just, I know what I am fucking on with. Now, look at the month. Look at the month. Right, Barry Hearns' company were in massive, massive, massive trouble. Now, Steve Davis, his other big snooker star, his other big star... He'd not won a world title after 1989, Steve Davis. He never won a title in the 90s. Stephen Hendry were dominant, dominant in the 90s. So the snoo he's on his knees with the snooker, and snooker were dying on its arse at this stage. So what does he do? He flukes a world title for a belt that nobody recognised at the time. So his first defence, he's got ABI, who was a blown-up cruiserweight. And he knows he's going to get beat up sooner or later. So what does Barry Hearn do? He cashes her behind in. He cashes him in to Vegas. Look. The house takes you when you go to Vegas. But not if you're Barry Hearn. He takes the house. <laughs> so Barry Hearn. March 95. Cashed in to Riddick Bow. Cashed in. Now... Let's have a look. When in 95, Christopher Livingston Eubanks. Let's have a look. When he lost in 95. 95, Steve Collins. Second loss. 18th for March. Now let's go back to the to the Herbie Hyde one. Right. There you go.
11th of March. So you can see you can see where the Barry Earns mindset were, can't you? The 11th of March, he's lost his world title to Riddick Bow. But he got cashed out, didn't he? He cashed in. So Herbie Hyde's lost his world title to Riddick Bow, 11th of March. Eleventh of March, so it is, it is what it is, isn't it? Oh, this a sec. Uh, Chris Eubank. Box wreck. So Chris Eubank, basically. Let me just get Rocky. What you have there? I'm trying. You're trying to get off my bed. Could you pump four, man, Rocky? Go get yourself a girlfriend, Rocky. <laughs> Right, so Steve Collins, a Steve Collins rematch was well, September. So Barry Earns' head must have been up his arse. But Chris Eubank, right, 18th for March, 95. 18, have we just had an 18th for March? 18th of March 95 18th of March 95 He's lost his first tie first fight to uh, To Collins Right Right he's lost his first fight to Collins 18th. Right, let me just drag that there. Let me drag that there and I'll learn how to do it proper now. Uh, so, as far as I'm concerned, that's the year that Barry Hearn had the heart attack in it and the company, he had his company run under a lot of pressure. He had a lot on that year, Barry Hearn, and you've got to admire somebody like that who navigated his way through all them tough times. And I bet Eddie didn't get to know about a lot about that. I mean, I've, I've seen interviews on it and stuff like that. 11th, sorry, 11th of March. So a week later, so he loses his heavyweight title to Riddick Bow, gets loads of money, then a week later, Eubank loses. A week later, Eubank loses. But they've got the rematch. Yeah, a week later, seven days later. Seven days later. Eubank losers after the after the uh, ABI would losers will tap so so picture this Barry Earn sat in his office 1995 and he said well we've got ABI would he's going to defend his world title next week Herbie's going to defend his world title in Vegas and we're all going to get paid and then a week later Eubank's going to fight in Ireland on another show that I don't have to put on because I'm Barry Earn and I let other promoters put these shows on. That's what I do. That's what I do. Because he won the purse bid, didn't he, Frank Warren? But, er. Uh, well, you've got to give them credit, haven't you? They're hard working men, them Earns. They're very hard working people. But like I've just said to you there, boxing is an industry. And Barry Yearn had an heart attack round about that time. I remember seeing Eddie in an interview and I read somewhere about it. So he's lost his heavyweight title to Riddick Bow, And then Eubanks lost a week later to Collins. And then he's wheeled Eubank out straight away quickly. Two months later, Eubanks back in Ireland fighting. A knockover job. Then another two months later, he was in Whitley Bay, and then another two months later, he's fighting Collins. What well, Eubank overworked? Yes, he was. He was a massive star. The point I'm trying to make to all you hardcore boxing fans is this: Don't have a go at me because I study the game. I've got all the stats here. Look, Christopher Eubank wasn't treated very good by the Herms. He's in a world title fight every two and a half months. But Anthony Joshua is in one every 4.4 month. He's on one every four and a half month. So do you see where I'm coming from here with this? With the Hearns, it's just about money. 
it's about money you've only got to look at the statistics and how they deal with everything they are money orientated even down to leasing Rolls Royces unbelievable money orientated people like you can never imagine it's unbelievable but it is what it is isn't it it's boxing isn't it but I don't know it nothing fails to surprise me anymore and I've studied I've studied them studied them at close and we all study it we try and take things from it I, I, I study match room and what how they go about their business and I have my little graphs and everything in my office and at Dennis's office and we study the game and we because sooner or later we'll get lucky we're a champion with us and we'll be in a situation like them it might not be now it might be in a few years but boxing moves in cycles now Christopher Eubank was out of the game in 95 September after the rematch the Hearns washed their hands of him best man at the wedding godfather to children apparently although don't quote me on that well, that's what I've heard but I know you got best man at wedding because I've heard back and I've seen photographs but but they washed their hands of him September 95 washed the hands of him after, get, after that man 393 rounds now let's have a look how many rounds Joshua's had. Let's have a look. Uh, <clears throat> well, Christopher Eubank. Christopher Eubank <clears throat> was 29 and one month. So he's just turned 29 and Barry Earns washed his hands with him. Joshua is 30 and two month old when he fights Andy Ruiz. Now up to the moment he's had 91 rounds. 91 rounds. Now Christopher Eubank were all washed up at 29 years of age. Now he retired when he was 31 with 393 rounds on the clock. But he were no good to the Hearns at 29 a couple of years before that. It was no good to him, no more, no good. Joshua has had 91 rounds and it looks like it could all be over for him. He's no mileage on clock. The Hearns will know this, this is why they're going to keep pumping him out there. He has no mileage on the clock. 91 rounds, oh my God. I do think he's got miles on clock. But the problem we've got with him is no skill set, has he? Anthony Joshua has got no skill set all right so all right now we're just going to try and find them other little clips that i promised you okay so you're getting a porky feast today all you hardcore boxing fans all you hardcores from the voice of hardcore boxing now joshua he's number three box wreck in the world let's have a look who the number one is number one is andy ruiz He's got four belts. Wilder's number two. He's got a belt. Number three is Joshua. He hasn't got a belt, but he's got a chance to fight for one. A chance to fight for four, sorry, in three months. Tyson Fury doesn't have a belt, but he's got this imaginary lineal status that's floating about in his head and all his fans' heads, but I don't know what they're on with. Alexander Povetkin, he's number five in the world. He's just beat Yui on points. Dillian White's number six. He's waiting on a drug test. So let's have a look. Ruiz one. Wilder two. Joshua three. Tyson Fury. He's a lineal man. But he's also got three black marks against his name for drugs. One failure test. Nandrolone. A cocaine test and a refusal. So he's got three black marks. Povetkin's got two black marks. Dillian White's got... One black mark and one he's waiting on. One pending. Gerald Miller's got two black marks. Ortiz has got two. Poole left's got a sex scandal thing behind him. Kaunaki I don't know not about. Joseph Parker's a Sky Company man. Chisora's put a woman over her knee and slapped her arse. He nearly ended up in jail. Got community serving. Ergovic I don't know about. Brazil's a big dummy. Oscar Rivers. He's suing Dillian White. Christian Aimer fought Tyson Fury, lost to him. It should have been a no contest, we're all waiting on it. General Washington, not even know much about him. Charlie Martin, Dana's worst world champion ever. 
Joe Joyce, he's same uh, age as Charlie Martin, and he's just starting out in his career. He's 10 and 0. Olympic silver should have been gold. David Price, massive puncher, the heart of a breadcrumb. Uh, Eve Geeney, Romanoff, never heard of him, 14 and 0. Thomas Adamek, 42 year old, old as the hills. Uh, Miller beat him and then he was going to fight uh, Joshua. Shocking. Yui Fury, 23 on box work. He's 24 years of age. Uh, he's 23 and 3. Former World Amateur Junior gold medal. Uh, I hope Yui gets back to uh, world level or fights for a world title again. Marco Oak. He needs to pack it in. He's 34 now. Effie Ajagbe, 25. He's 11 and now. Let's see who, who's left after these. Takam's 26 on box rec. He's 39. Next birthday. Dubar's 27. He's an handful for anybody. He's only 22 years of age. Is he 22 today? He's 12 and 0. Ajit Kabayel. He's 19 and 0. He's 26 years of age. Kabayel. That's him there. Pretty clean cut. He's 28 on box rec. He's beat Derek Chisora. He's undefeated and uh, he's had the European title. One, two, three, four, five. He's won the European title, defended it four times. And he hasn't got much of a profile. But let me tell you this Kabayel, there you go. He's the European champion. Why, hasn't he, why is he ranked below Derek Chisora? Derek Chisora is ranked number 12 here, right? And he's lost. And he's got nine defeats. He's lost to Caballel, who's 19 and 0, he's 26. He's probably not got a big promotional team behind him, Caballel. Then you've got Petter Mellis, Simon Keane, Sergey Kuzmin, Artur Spilka. Dave Allen's in at number 33. Dave Allen ranked 33, 33rd best heavyweight in the world. And Caballel's 28, he's 19 and 0. Dave's 17, 5 and 2. He's only 27, Dave. He's been knocked from pillar to post. Dave Allen's ranked above Ilenius, Eric Molina, Hunter and Lucas Brown and Jennings. Dave Allen's ranked above Stavern. Jesus. Dave Allen's ranked above Yoker, who bashed him up for 10 rounds at the same age. And he bashed him up for 10 rounds. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It is totally unbelievable. Cunningsbury United Kingdom flying the flag for us, aren't you, Dave? So, basically, that's basically what it is, really. It's shocking, isn't it? I know that. But what can you do? So, I'm just going to put these other clips on and then we're going to call it a day for today because I've uh, interacted with you again and I'll be getting my good interaction score for engaging with you. This is what I'm... This is what it's called at the moment. I'm engaging with you. And the YouTube software, which is fucking worth millions and millions, it picks up on everything that I'm saying to you now. So as long as I'm doing well with them, my channel will do all right. So two sec. Right, here's the, uh, the joke thing I was telling you about. When you've got Johnny Nelson, Bellew, Coldwell, and you know all them little Klingons, Spencer Oliver. They're all falling about all over the place, you know, laughing at one of Eddie Earn's jokes. But even Eddie knows, Eddie knows he's not that funny. And then you've got Frotch and Glen McCrory. They weren't laughing. Maybe they didn't hear the joke. I don't know. But who cares anyway? But the point I'm trying to make is this. When you're at the top of your game and you tell a joke, your social standing's higher than everybody else's. Do you know what I mean? I see it all the time. I see Dennis Hobson crack jokes in pubs. And I go, then that one even funny. You know, go, oh God, grow up, man. Oh. But when you've got people who do it all the time, right, they've got to do it because they have to stay in with you. They have to work their ticket. Everything has to be perfect because... People like people when they're giving you something. For example, Mike Tyson once told somebody who I know that everybody used to like him. 
and he said it was because he was buying them cars and giving them everything he were a meal ticket and he was he could take them to a place that they can't go to and that's what boxing like boxing's like at times but every now and then people begin to be, begin to believe their own hype now Eddie Hearn's walking on water and he's basically doing what he wants now everybody knows that He's been going around saying if he gets Anthony Yard, Daniel Dubois and Tyson Fury, that he's going to finish off Frank Warren. This is what he's saying now. He blames Frank Warren for his dad's heart attack in the 90s, doesn't he? But I think it's just Barry Hearns had an heart attack because he was a hard-working guy. He used to run to work in the morning, Barry Hearn. He'd run to work in the morning and then work all day and be at it all day. And stress can... can can kill you in end or can play have it with your heart now Eddie probably wants to even a few scores up for his dad which anybody's going to want to do aren't they that's why he took Jamie McDonald off Dennis because Ricky Hatton were on his way down motorway to sign with Barry Earn and Dennis rung him up and offered Ray Hatton a deal they turned car around and they did a deal with Dennis didn't they it's on my channel if you look £300,000 just to convince them to sign. And they went with Dennis, didn't they? They went 4 and 0 with Dennis. And then the parted company just before Mayweather fight. So Dennis did all the heavy lifting, broke America with him, didn't he? And then got shafted. He did all the heavy lifting with Jamie McDonnell. 13 and 0, British Commonwealth, European and World Champion in a soccer stadium in Doncaster. Jamie McDonnell backstabbed him and went to Eddie Hearn. Now, Eddie Hearn will have felt good about himself doing that but sooner or later every now and then the boxing landscape changes doesn't it now I can't tell you how much of Eddie Hearn's life is going to be invested now in this Ruiz fight but does he care? No this is why they're trying to get as much money out of boxing as they can listen I'm just going to show you now this is what I mean by not everybody He's up your arse or hanging out the back of your arse and it's not nice when them people are not. Like Carl Frampton, he weren't hanging out the back of Eddie Hearn's arse, was he? When he didn't like what he heard, him and his missus, they decided they didn't want to work with Eddie. And that left Eddie in a bit of a in a bit of a tango because his ego had didn't. Now just watch this here. This is the point I make about when nobody like not everybody laughs at your jokes. It's not nice. Especially when everybody's back slapping you all the time. There you go. There's a bell you there, Johnny Nelson, Spencer Oliver. Look at them all. Look at him there. He's not laughing, is he? Oh, Feach, he wasn't laughing, so they got rid of Feach, didn't they? They got rid of Feach, didn't they? And that's what happens. You get rid of people, don't you? So, it is what it is, isn't it? So, but that's what I wanted to make. Point I wanted to make, so peace out.